Hello and welcome to A Day for Nature, the series where we ask you to take just one day out of your usual holiday routine to explore the wildlife that may be right on your hotel doorstep. This time we're in Singapore. True, not the most likely of destinations for exploring nature, but that's what this series is all about. For instance, in part two we take a boat ride for a tidal walk in search of crabs, coral and starfish. Whilst in just a moment we find ourselves with some very unusual critters in one of Asia's oldest rainforests. But before we head for the rainforests and beaches, let's explore this exciting city. It's modern, brash and very, very clean. That's how I would sum it up if I only had one sentence to do so. Because this city is a global business centre, it seems to have everything. Great shopping, great restaurants and, of course, great hotels. It feels very safe in comparison to many other Asian cities, but for that very reason, it lacks a little of the excitement you feel when walking the streets of Bangkok, Hong Kong or Delhi. Its safeness, though, is what makes it great for family holidays perhaps even to test the water for a slightly more adventurous Asian trip. This is the new part of town, Clark Quay, a riverside festival village with five blocks worth of dining, shopping and entertainment. Here you will find trendy speciality restaurants, theme pubs and wine bars. If you're a little more adventurous, visit the Boat Quay but do allow plenty of time as every restaurant owner will try and persuade you to dine at his place, which has, of course, the very best food in town. So, fine hotels like the Fullerton here, the former general post office, good food and shopping, but not much in the way of wildlife. However, it does exist, otherwise I wouldn't be here. Our criteria is that any day trip should be less than an hour from your resort. So let's look at the maps and see what we can find. First off, and the rainforest of Bukit Timah. This nature reserve is incredibly just half an hour outside of the city and is very well known by taxi drivers. For our marine trip, we visit Palau Samakar Island. This takes approximately 15 minutes by boat. For more details on both these trips, visit wildsingapore.com. From glass and steel to a canopy of green leaves. This is the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. It's dark, partially because we're under these towering sipu trees, but mostly because it's very horribly early. The reason we're so early is my guide for the day, the Education and Research Officer for the Raffles Museum of Biodiversity Research. They're pretty elusive, aren't they? Yeah, we'll try and look for them. We're in search of the Kalugo, nicknamed the Flying Lima, and I'm determined to be the first to spot one. But first... It's a squirrel. Yeah, it's actually a slender squirrel. And it's very common in the Bukit Timah Nature Reserve. They're very timid. Um, yeah, but um, they, when there's less people, they would come out to the open to feed. These little fellas somehow seem to defy the laws of gravity. In good light, you can see that they're brown, with light grey to the tummy. They'll feed on nuts, soft tree bark, fruits, and even small insects. Aha! Uh -huh. That's who's making all the noise. It's a cicada. This is the music of the rainforest, made only by the male by vibrating membranes at the sides of his body. Looking for a quieter life, this clouded monitor lizard is on the move. He can grow up to 1.5 metres long, and his very sharp claws make him an excellent climber. I'd like to say that no creatures were harmed in the making of this film, but I stood on a termite <laughs> trail. <laughs> but they're pretty small, aren't they? Yeah, well, actually, the biomass of all the ants and termites in the rainforest, uh, they are add up uh, more than the combined weight of all the other larger animals. That's amazing, isn't it? Mm. But, I mean, how many are there? When do they stop? I have no idea. <laughs>
do they bite? Do I have to worry about them? Or? Well, these are these are worker termites, and they don't bite. But uh, there are sentries, um, the soldiers uh, do bite. Yeah. Presum um, presumably, the soldiers are. Soldiers they're much are bigger. bigger, and they've they've got a huge mandible. Yeah. yeah. But it is quite incredible, and they're moving from one tree to another. Well, they they um, they usually would find a rotting um, log where they collect all the wood yeah. and bring them back to the nest. They are hard workers. Still no sign of the flying lemurs I so wanted to see, but I have found a new friend. Look at that. It's the, where's he gone? But he is one of the world's largest ants, and he's huge. What's his name? Forest, giant forest ant. Giant forest ant. Ah, he's so fast. As the light slowly builds, the reserve gets busier with tourists. There are supposed to be plenty of macaque monkeys as well, but I've seen neither hide nor long tail of them either. You really do need a guide to make the most of the plants, insects and animals. Their trained eyes and awareness of habitat is invaluable. Especially if you come across a snake. Although generally, if you leave them alone, they're not aggressive. Some snakes here are highly venomous, such as the pit viper, but not this one. He's a reticulated python who, when he grows fully, will feed on mammals such as small deer or pigs by constricting and suffocating his prey before ingesting. Lovely. Pythons are known to use heat-sensitive pits in the labial scales in the lining of their lips to find their prey. In Asia, they can be found in many urban areas, where the dish of the day would be rats and even cats. At worst, and on a few occasions, very large adult pythons have been known to kill and eat people. With that in mind, and given that even very small pythons can give a nasty bite if you don't know how to handle them properly, it seemed a very good plan to ask the park ranger, Ben, to handle our slithery discovery. So he's, he's obviously a, a small python. Yeah, and these guys um, grow up to be about more than 10 metres. Wow, yeah. And, and he has got the honour of being the longest snake in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Very beautiful. Yeah. But very upset at the moment at us, yeah? That's right, that's right. <laughs> but he would bite, but a harmless bite. Yeah. Um, well, uh, it can give a very nasty bite yeah, if it's yeah. provoked and yeah. um, it, it has been known to take prey as large as a sun bear. Really? Yeah, and we are talking about a 23 kg bear. Yeah. Um, and that was a 7 meter python known from East Kalimantan that swallowed an entire bear. What other snakes have you got here? Uh, we've got the blue coral snake which is uh, very, um, which is extremely venomous. Yeah. Um, belong to the Crete family. Yeah. Um, King Cobra, and yeah. of course a spitting cobra. Yeah. Yeah. But a lot of other um, non-venomous snakes. Yeah. yeah. Around in the reserve. Beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. At last, we find what I've been so keen to see. Hanging motionless to a trunk high in the trees is one of the strangest of creatures the flying lemur. Well, actually he's not a lemur, and he doesn't fly. He more sort of glides like a kite. But apart from that, I think he's really cool. Very impressive. The real name for this animal is the Malayan Kalugo. This nocturnal creature moves from tree to tree by stretching out the membranes that connect its limbs and tail. To see them gliding by day is quite rare, but because it's still quite dark, we may have luck on our side. How about this for an action replay? Now I can see why we struggled to spot him. His mottled brown fur provides the perfect camouflage against the tree. Yeah. 
Well worth the effort, I feel, and spotted just in time, as we have to head back, as this rainforest is getting awfully busy. One local form of exercise, it seems, is to walk backwards up and down the main hill. <laughs> this couple were blatantly disobeying the rules, so of course I insisted they play the game properly. And they did. Now that really is quite bizarre. And can you believe it? We eventually found the macaque monkeys in the car park just as we're leaving. If you do meet them here on your visit, please don't feed them as they're beginning to be urbanised and can get quite stroppy, especially with small children. Well, tomorrow's another day with another early start for our seashore adventure. See you after the break. Welcome back, and this is Singapore. Yep, still here, and before we head to the beach, I thought it prudent to show you a little more about this vibrant city. In great contrast to this modern financial sector of the city, my favourite part of Singapore is Chinatown. Here, the aroma of great Chinese gourmet and josh sticks adds to the shopping atmosphere. It's a great place for knickknacks, computers, cameras, antiques and tailored suits that can be made to measure all in a day. It's here that you really do feel that you've travelled somewhere a little more exotic. And it's here that I chose to stay at this boutique hotel, the New Majestic. It's mid-price, fun and quirky, mostly because every room is designed by a different artist. There are many popular rooms in this hotel, but probably the top of the list, um, we do have the Fluid Room. Fluid Room is a designer room done by a fashion show designer, and his name is Wai Kit Song. And the room is a lovely room, and we've had many people calling it the Austin Powers Room. We also have the Wacky uh, Pussy Parlor, <laughs> that's done by a fashion show producer called Daniel Boy and um, it's very characteristic of him is in blue and psychedelic pink you have a topless mermaid neon, neon lights that says pussy parlor so <laughs> that's quite wacky quite wacky as a swimming pool with large round viewing windows to the restaurant below still I didn't stay in the pussy parlour room, and so I did have a very good night's sleep, which is just as well because we're up at the crack of dawn again. Now this looks like fun. Never mind road rage, this is boat rage. Well, it's over. Oh my gosh, it's early, 0700, and it's early morning chaos. And we're off on an island adventure. It's only a 15 minute boat trip to our destination, the island of Palau Samakam. There are plenty of islands here to visit, but the one that we're heading to is a man-made creation. In fact, it's Singapore's first landfill island and is actually formed by the amalgamation of two smaller islands. It's in the heart of industry here. I really wanted to see what nature could survive, if any, with so many chemical plants and so close to one of the busiest shipping lanes in the world. That's one thing about filming wildlife. Is you need a good heavy tripod. Thanks, Alex. Oh, oh. It's a new day, and with a new expert guide, we get straight down to business, along with a boat full of students from the University of Singapore. This is going to be fun. First off, to get to the beach, we have to pass through a midge-infected forest. Note to self, don't forget the mozzie spray. I did. Too late. Oh, well. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? We're only 15 minutes, really, out of the city. It's... It's fantastic. It's really, really nice if you uh, to look here, you know, coconut trees, of course. But there's also wild orchids that are growing as epiphytes on the, uh, on the branches, ferns coming down. Sounds good, isn't it? It does, yeah. Ah, yes, the pleasant sound of students crashing through a jungle. 
Still, given the time of the morning, they look cheery enough. But they have walked straight past this eight-legged wonder. Quite how? I don't know. This spider is large. He is absolutely beautiful, isn't he? It's a she, not a he. A she? Yes. I'm sorry, dear. Yeah, the <laughs> he's are really, really small. Uh, the males are minuscule, right. size of a pinhead. Oh, really? Yes. Absolutely beautiful. So many colours. Yes, it's called the uh, golden orb spider. But the front side is just full of yellows, and if you look on the legs, mm. there's all these, uh, at the joints, there's all these yellow, yellow bits, which are, you know, really attractive. Very attractive. Now look closely at the little spider. That's her fella. Isn't nature strange? I mean, how does that work? I guess that's another story. Moving on swiftly to the edge of the sea, this is why it had to be an early start today, because we're following a low tide. A relentless tide that waits for nobody. These tidal walks are once a month, but they give a fantastic opportunity to see coral of all sorts of shapes, sizes and varieties. The sort of coral, really, that you'd usually need a mask and snorkel to see. Like this pink, soft coral. Temporarily above the water for an hour or two for anyone to see. But this doesn't happen every day. Once a month, we get a very extreme tidal difference, you know, during the spring tide and, you know, the water level gets really low. Uh, so what happens then is that, you know, we bring students, members of the public, out um, to this island, it's called Sumakau, um, you know, and carry out a tidal walk. And it's very interesting because there are very many habitats within the small area. You know, you have secondary forests, you know, way out there, then you have mangroves, and then you have sort of a muddy shore, and then seagrass, and then you have coral reefs, which is just amazing. So, you know, people, when they come here, they see a whole diversity of habitats and plants and animals, so it's pretty exciting. So, to make the most of this, plan your trip with a spring tide in mind. These are usually based around a full moon. So, what have you got here? OK, what we have here are two mushroom corals. And unlike a lot of the corals that we've seen, uh, you know, where they are just many, many organisms living together. They're a colony of animals. Mushroom coral, this one, is just one single animal. So in that aspect, it's very different from other corals. So they're very interesting. Um, you know, this is like almost like a skeleton. It's calcium carbonate. And the actual animal is living inside uh, where the soft tissue is. So it's almost protected. And they do look like mushrooms somewhat. Plodding around in rock pools is great fun. But the mangrove backdrop here is interesting as well. So this is a mangrove seed? It's a seedling. It has already started growing. Right. But it stays on the parent tree until it's ready to you know, drop off. Yeah. And what happens is, uh, you know, it can either settle immediately by just, you know, coming down this way. Yeah. Or it gets washed out uh, with the water, in which case and it gets washed out horizontally. Right. Like that. And when it decides to settle, then uh, the part which you know would grow into a root would, um, would then take in a lot of water, be very heavy, and then start sinking slowly. Wow. Yeah, and then you get... Here's one we prepared earlier. Exactly. <laughs> Three years ago, a sapling. Yeah. And then they become like that. Lovely. It's beautiful here, and yet kind of eerie with such large ships just off the shoreline. It's thanks to very tight shipping regulations on waste disposal that the nature here seems to cope very well. Like this little puffer fish, caught out by the tide and surviving in just an inch of water. He'll be fine, though, in just an hour or so. Well, there's about four species of seagrasses here. You can just tell them apart. There's a, one which is long and, you know, like an eel, yeah. there's the short ones, and then there's ones which are really thin, you know, like blades coming out of the seabed. And then there's the ones which are oval. These are the ones that the dugongs eat. So it's a very rich area. Plus, there's also on top of it algae all around. There's so much life here, especially in the seagrass. 
Oh, fruits of seagrass, amazing. You guys are too lucky. This, this is just not possible. Sometimes Except people get the... excited about the strangest of things. Yeah, it's a fruit of this one. Very rare, apparently, but I'm more interested in this moving bit of sand. He's really good at, you know, camouflaging. If you, uh, let's just maybe see if we can get him out. Sneak Poor him little out. fella. Yeah. Come on. Okay, let's see. <laughs> let's go. All right. Oh, there you go. Oh. Yeah, do you see all the hairs on the body? Yeah. Yeah, we call him the uh, common shore crab, or common hairy shore crab, because he's so hairy it really helps in the camouflage because you get all the sand and the silt sticking to him and then you know he becomes invisible. Is he nip? No, not really. A bit. But look at the eyes. Yeah. It's red. Red eyes. Mm. But the biggest seashore critter of the day was still to be found. The sea star. You call these knobbly sea stars? Mm, knobbly sea stars, that's I right. I call it a starfish, but... It's kind of a starfish. <laughs> Shall we look at the two feet at yeah, the bottom? Yeah. The thing that's helping this guy move so fast. Yeah, I mean... Uh, he's really, geez. really huge and heavy. He's but if you just chunky. move it up... Wow. And you take a look. Oh, yeah. he's closing up. Yeah. But once he relaxes, then you can see the... Uh, the feet coming out. Mm. Oh, there you go. Beautiful. Yeah. Th this is where he eats. This is where he eats. Yeah. And right about here mm -hmm. is where he... Gets rid of everything. Exactly. Yeah. They're kind of like hoovers, you know. They just slide yeah. along, don't they? Taking everything in in their path and yes. pushing it all out. Pushing it all out. He's okay, he's beautiful. He is beautiful. Shall we put him down? Yeah, man. Yeah, sure. Just feel the weight. Gosh, he is really heavy. Quite a character, huh? In you go. Hey. Wow. So much nature in the heart of so much industry. It's thanks again to extremely tight pollution controls set by the government of Singapore. This proves that man can work alongside nature if the right policies are put in place. Well, the tide's coming back fast now, so if I was to hang around here, I'd be underwater presenting this. So that really is all the time we've got left. I hope you've enjoyed the show. Till the next time, goodbye.